On behalf of the New York University Abu Dhabi Institute, I'd like to welcome you to Radical Craft, Reimagining Crochet. Our evening is presented in conjunction with the beautiful NYU Abu Dhabi Crochet Coral Reef Project on display, along with the Crochet Coral Reef works from the Institute of Figuring that you've taken in and seen outside. Um, let's just give a round of applause to the wonderful crochet artists, artists who've made those pieces. They're so beautiful and I was so happy to see all of you looking at them before tonight's presentation. To introduce the evening, I would like to pose and explore two questions. First, what is crochet? Second, what can crochet do? Well, here is one answer to the first question. Take yarn. Would you hold this for me, please? Thank you. Take a single needle with a hook. This is a crochet needle, so it's different than knitting, right? And make knots in a chain. Want me to do it? Sure, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> now crochet a new line of knots building off of the first ones you've made. And you are building a plane, a surface. Keep going. With the tools and materials in hand, what will you make? I tell my students in my writing classroom, this is not too dissimilar from the act of writing. If writing is laying down a line of words, one idea linking with the next, and the page is a surface, we may not know what we will say until we are involved with our materials, or at least until we have picked up the pen. The second question, what can crochet do? In my classroom, I invite students to identify binaries, things that are supposed to be in opposition. I then say, welcome to college, where it's your task to question the binary's very terms. This evening, let's take the following binaries, cylindrical string and flat surface, endangerment and evolution, fine art and craft, utility and decoration, animate and the inanimate, the living and the dead, the hard and the soft, the figurative and the abstract, the sciences and the arts, and let's explode them. That's what the crochet works of Christine Wertheim, Shona Richardson, and Toshiko McAdam do so while surfaces seem to abound in their works, they're actually made of nodding and therefore empty spaces. While playground shapes are meant to be touched and inhabited, they're also visually pleasing. While some would have us believe that there's nothing to be done in the face of eco-crisis, and similarly, the individual artist runs up against their own limits all the time, a fluxing group of Abu Dhabi crocheters has gathered for a year and made something they could have never imagined singularly. This is the power of radical craft and crochet reimagined. But before my introduction starts sounding like a conclusion, let's get to the body, the living body of tonight's essay, and that is our guest crocheters. So they will all present and then we'll have a question and answer as a panel and then invite questions from the audience. So to begin, let's please welcome Shona Richardson. Uh, good evening, my name is Shona Richardson and I make realistic life-size animals using crochet. Um, the pieces that I create look something like taxidermy, so I combined the words crochet and taxidermy, came up with the name crochet dermy. Um, when meeting people for the first time, I often refer to myself as a crochet dermist um, because if I introduce myself as somebody who crochets animals, that's usually the end of any further conversation. <laughs> um, so while I tell you about how I came to use crochet in my work, I'll just click through some uh, images of the pieces that I make. They're going to be quite quick because there's a lot of images there. But um, I live in Leicester in England where I studied fine art. 
Um, I went to De Montfort University where I thought I'd first find out what art was, then I would study it and then make it. Um, but unsurprisingly, I never did find a satisfactory definition of art, so I was kind of stuck there. But what I did find were lots of different opinions. Um, so I made do with taking an opinion on the subject and making work that pushed against the boundaries set out in that opinion. So for example, anything that has no practical use can be art. And at the time, the most practical thing I could think of was my van. And that's because the university had a no parking policy, very strict. Um, and I lived in a little village on the outskirts of town and it was very difficult for me to get in and out of university. So I set out to try and convince the university board that my van was art. Um, and then I had to get permission to exhibit it on site and I chose the um, staff car park. So I did manage to do that. Um, the only condition that the university set was that to protect this piece of artwork, I had to remove it from campus every night and bring it back every morning, which was, <laughs> I had no objection to that. Um, the reason that the car park project was success successful is because there's a rich history of artwork to draw upon that supports the theory that anything can be art, um, from urinals to bricks to lights turning on and off. So I have a um, couple of examples of the things that I've made. So you can see them behind me. But I've, I've never been a big fan of rules, and so um, <laughs> it was perhaps inevitable that I'd be attracted to artists who played with ideas and pushed boundaries of, you know, with art. And I wanted to push forward too, but it seemed like in a climate where anything can be art, there were no boundaries left. There was just, just nowhere left to go. So uh, I was left with the empty space and wondering where I could go forward from that. So gradually, in search of rules, I started to look backwards towards things like, that would challenge contemporary ideas of art. So I looked at objects and collecting things and accessible things and nice things, at craft, the artist's hand, and putting work back on the plinth. Um, the work I make now evolved over a long period of time. It's the same questions about art running through it, but the concept and the kind of rebellion that's in my work is hidden behind the handmade nature of the work and the skills that are on show and the sort of the human endeavour and the nice accessible outcome. Um, so I think that maybe I'm still searching for answers, but in the absence of getting to the bottom of what is what art is, that maybe I'm making work is that questions, you know, what art isn't really. So that's kind of why I'm using crochet. Um, the first thing I made was in 2007 and it was a seven foot brown bear. I like a challenge. Uh, the pieces are taken at face value and from day one there's been a lot of interest in them as nice decorative objects and happily because I enjoy the making process it's led to all sorts of different uh, interesting projects over the years. Um, one of them was, I think it's on there, is it Prince Harry? Uh, in mm. 2010 I was commissioned by uh, the Guardian Weekend magazine to create a piece based on a living royal uh, member of the royal family and I chose Prince Harry and uh, that's, that's a result of that one. <laughs> and this year I was invited to exhibit at the Chelsea Flower Show in London. And for this I created Bojo, which is this fella here. Uh, he's a life-size blonde gorilla based on the current mayor of London, Boris Johnson. Um, those that are familiar with him, maybe see a likeness there, I, I don't know. But um, anyway, I'll finish with a short film of Lionheart, which is a piece that I made for um, the Cultural Olympiad. Um, in 2010, it was a flagship project that was to be on uh, exhibition in 2012. Um, and I made 25 foot, three 25 foot lions, um, which I then put in a glass mobile case and toured them around uh, the country in villages and cities. It used to just drive around there uh, throughout 2012. So there should be at the end of this a little bit of film of it when it was travelling around London before it was installed outside the Natural History Museum for the duration of the Games.
we'll hear from Toshiko McAdam. Toshiko. Okay, how do you do? Nice to meet you, and I'm not English speaker, right? Then um, I might say something strange, but uh, <laughs> please excuse me. And um, I, since I was little, I love to draw and I love to paint, and I escape when I have to do hard studying, right? Then always with me, and when I was in high school, I, I went to a very specialized high school, all these brilliant people got in in exam. Then I realized how much I can do, and um, well, I gave up to going to medical school, then I decided to go to art school, and which is shocking for most of the friends. <laughs> And for example, my grandfather was a doctor, my father was a doctor, I have three brothers a doctor, my four cousins are doctor. You know, it came from, this was a norm, right? But here I am, things a little bit strange, maybe tiny bit dyslexia, and um, language is not my forte. Then um, one day, in, when I was, you know, uh, high school students, I'm going to go to art school. Then it was very strange from this high school to go art school, and uh, people said, you are brave. Well, I don't have so much choice. And um, I went to, and then I decided to take textile rather than fine art. And uh, fine art seems that time is very old fashioned. And who, what was cool is design, and um, product design, graphic design, and uh, interior design. Then I look at textile, very old fashioned, it's just not appealing. Then I decide to take that. It's perfect for geek. <laughs> then, you know, uh, I had a heavy eyeglass, chubby, and uh, I took very seriously. And I found very interesting in textile and structure. Fabric is a structure, right? Words. And um, that part was all my life, 50 years, I'm searching structure of the textile. Then uh, my approach in the, in the crocheting is not my main. And I, I'm going to show you my crocheting work because I choose crocheting to create organic shape the most easy in textile field. And crocheting is never been industrialized and only you can do by hand. Then, when I was 1969, I, my crocheting experimental piece, and I, my interest in is textile, space, structure, and human. This relationship I was searching. This is, um, I try to use crocheting technique to make uh, free forms in the air, of course, people liked it very much, you know, it was boarded right away. And um, hung in Australia, <laughs> and photographs were taken. Then those, I had a number of those experimental work and exhibit, and uh, it's different technique, knitting and others. Then people react very, you know, nicely and they liked it, but I wasn't quite satisfied in my deep inside I'm just, you know, self-indulgent. Then I started thinking much deeply, like half year I was quite depressed, which is not my world. I'm always up and high, then without any drug, you know, just <laughs> happy. When I get up in the morning, I'm a very happy person. I ate well, I slept well, what am I going to do? But only one time in my life, you know, why? Something missing. Then I start thinking, maybe textile is more like a human connection between human. Then I realized textile is human skin, very mimicking and making a hole to breathable. To make a hole, little hole, we made a different structures. Then one crochet is a hexagon hole. That's why you can make organic shape. And most of the textile is a square or diamond shape. Then I used this textile, you know, crocheting technique and made a square and to make a space to find a, a more like I call cell. Okay. Then in this exhibition, there's the children came in and jumped in. <laughs> and, and in the gallery, it was jumped up. I said, beautiful, this is it. What I was searching is I'm going to make a piece for children. Then 
it means meanwhile I became freelance and uh, I had live myself you know support myself I saved money and I had chance to make for a nursing school this is the first my piece then this is 1973 I made another one you know f first I try to change energy to different directions and how to make stronger exhibit in the art exhibition. 1979, I had a chance to work landscape architect. This is National Park. My. And children went to crazy. <laughs> it's jiggles and vibration goes next. Then suddenly start, you know, you don't know what to do it. It just, just screams and screams. <laughs> and this is it, this is my joy. Then 1981, Sculpture Museum commissioned me this piece, it's uh, 680 kilo of the material. I crocheted by stitch by stitch one year. I dyed fibers in the small pots, day after day after, months <coughs> and months. And this last 28 years, at the end, it's worn out, but people loved it. And some children, some people came back and forth, and now some of the ch children who worked there uh, who played there became curator in this museum and they bring their children. This is my book, From the Line Become Plain. Plain becomes three dimensional. That part I worked like every once in a week in, in um, 10 years, drawing and reconstructed and figuring out drawing. About 6,000 drawing I did and I selected. Then museum found me what I'm doing and became a book. Then this is a few photo I show you. This is a not structural with crocheting, more like I use netting and decorative way of using crocheting to express. This is a luminous, I like luminous column. I like to express luminous. And um, this was when I had a child. I saw the space in the museum. I can see red light is running through then I produced this piece. You can see that. Then I had a commission stage garden, 20 meter. Then I used same technique. Then this is uh, 1998. I had a commission to work for the volcanic mountain, Mount Fuji's project. Then image of the volcan volcano. Then I had a chance to work with landscape architects in 1998 to 2002 years, an underground cave and create most gigantic crochet piece. And the back little one is a disabled children's work and climbing up kids are coming out from the holes and peeking in. You can see layer of the children and coming out screaming. <laughs> then this is a, in 2007, I had a chance to make a Ghana gallery in Korea. One was a big you know, uh, gallery. And the image is more like a Korean. Then this is my studio working we make from fiber dyes in knitted form and braided our own yarn. Then takes forever. You know, you have one machine and create it. Then a crocheting stitch by stitch. And this was 2009 for Sculpture Museum for replacement. And working in well-known architect who produced this wooden structure and since 16th century, this is the biggest wooden structure in Japan. And doesn't use, just peg. It was no nail anything, just peg. Then this was a huge success. Yeah. And um, one couple came back, we met, who used to play in this net, my early one. And they met on a net. <laughs> they played and then, you know, they contact a few years, but separated, they met in university. And they start dating, they married, they brought two children. <laughs> and 
our son cried in this story. And finally, he said, I understand why you are so crazy to work in this one. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the joy of children. Main reason, same time, 1973, I spent three years researching in Tokyo in situation. And Tokyo was rising that time. And I was so worried about it. You know, I came out after the war. We played on the street. And uh, parents doesn't watch you anything. We did all kind of naughty things. Mm -hmm. Then we fight with boys. Yeah. I was a strong one. <laughs> then, you know, I could commanding all these kids. Then what happened if they don't know how to deal with physically? Mm -hmm. These kids does not know how to live in social, social world. Then isolating. And then I start working for this project. Mm -hmm. Then I like to make a space children just naturally play, not forcing, not competitive. If you touch it, go inside, you know, naturally moves and vibration goes to each other. And this piece was, um, then I left from art world quite a long time because it's conceptual art, right? Then um, th th this mark last December, I was commissioned, not commissioned, they, they, they had a sponsor and, um, and now, one of the biggest you know, energy company in, in Europe, sponsored via, in Venice Biennale. And uh, they sponsors, they choose one artist in a year in the world, and uh, we are chosen. And um, in short time, we have to work very hard to create this piece. But this one, others can get in. And they had a great time because of the stretchness and uh, has a own grass in space, you know, and it's going to be narrow than usual. And also, seating is very high. Then the image came up, you know, when I was standing there.
a fantastic feeling as a female. You know, you want to be mother of the many children, and then if they had a fantastic time, that gave me great pleasure. I would like to do next as long as I live. <laughs> and the textile will be worn out naturally, but there is a strength. Then, just like human life, and uh, this, you know, whatever we make right now, to me, this is important. I'm not thinking the future to leave my artwork, no. People who live now and enjoy it, and then they will create something. And then I just want to do as long as live it to create another pieces and more. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody, and I'd just like to say it's a real honour to be here today with these two fabulous artists whose work Margaret and I have admired for a very long time. Um, so I'm just going to talk about a, a couple of different aspects of our project. My PowerPoint was actually designed for a slightly longer talk, so I'm going to move on slightly. Um, Jill asked the two questions at the beginning of her, pres her introduction. What is crochet and what can it do? And in answer to the first question, I'd like to propose that crochet is a digital technology. It's a digital technology for the 21st century. Um, it's a digital technology in a number of different senses. First of all, you make it with your hands. And second of all, like many different handicraft, um, handicrafts based on yarn, you can notate the structure with symbolic notations. And just as you can notate the structure by using symbolic notations, that is the traditional crochet, uh, the traditional crochet kind of written forms that you see in crochet pattern books, that means that you can do two things. Like music, while you read the structure, you actually make the structure. So as you read, you play. And, that all, and it also means that because you can note the, notate the structure, you can also create new compositions which actually enable you to explore the structure. And, but also like great musicians, you don't necessarily need the notation once you understand the structure well enough. You don't need the notation you can just do the playing or do the making in this case and explore structure with your hands. And so the way Margaret and I think about crochet, and it started because we started making hyperbolic crochets and then making the reef project, we think of, uh, of our project less as an artwork and more as a research project. And, and initially what we were researching was structure. Uh, initially it was the structure of hyperbolics and then it moved into other structures. But I just want to point out a, a slight historical point here that in the beginning of the age of computers, um, it's not an accident that when I talk about crocheting being a digital technology, uh, in the age of the beginning of computers, what is called core memory, which is was the the way that computers stored memory in the very early eras of computing. Um, it was made of these lattice-like structures that had little, uh, little lead disks that go around the intersections of the lattices. So this is what one looks like up close. And then this is, uh, they're made into these individual units so that the units can be of different varieties. And then the units are stacked or they were stacked in a big, uh, well, in, in a big pile, and then the, all the rest of the wiring came out from there. And it was very difficult to make these units in the beginning because they required immensely fine handiwork. And in fact, the women, all of the early core memory was in fact made by women because it was women with their training with samplers and knitting and other kinds of handicraft who had the, the digital skills to make these things. So not only is crochet a digital technology because we make it with our hands, but the other kind of digital technology that has the whizzy stuff going through it was actually originally developed and could only be because 
of two things. One is that the hardware required the handicraft skills of women to bring it physically into being, and two, because we'd learned through the capacity to notate handicrafts how to turn structures into notations. Um, so people who sort of think of women's handicraft and computing and digital technology as two radically different things actually are, uh, they're not two radically different things. They're actually very intertwined, both historically and conceptually. Um, so I'll just move on. So we started, uh, Margaret and I started the Institute for Figuring in 19, 2000, 2003. And uh, our aim was to bring ideas from maths and science to the general public because we believe that people, there are so many decisions people are going to have to make in the future and already now that require a scientific, some scientific knowledge in order to make an informed decision. Uh, such as, for instance, whether you vote for stem cell research or not shouldn't be based entirely on your politics, but on what is the science involved and is it actually going to be useful. So uh, we started working with scientists and um, my sister Margaret's a science writer. And we started working with scientists whose ideas could be embodied in some physical form so that people could see what they were working on and touch it and handle it and, and, and understand it physically because m most of us can't understand the mathematics if it's just a purely conceptual thing, that is if it's written in equations, which is the way scientists often communicate with each other. So we wanted work, we wanted to talk about work that could be embodied physically and that would help people understand ideas th through spatial and tactile and structural things that they could handle and, and, and have sensual interaction with. Um, so the, one of the early projects was we met a woman called Dana Tamina who invented a way to um, make what are called hyperbolic surfaces, which are the curly surfaces you get on lettuces and kales using crochet. And prior to that, scientists had discovered hyperbolic geometry, but they didn't have a physical way of making the model, so they could only think about it conceptually through equations. So Dana started making models and then we started working with her and we started making models. And in the beginning, like her, our models looked like models. That is to say they were very simple and in plain colours, but I'm not that kind of person, um, as you can see. If you, especially, if, especially if you're at the reception last night. So I started, uh, and these, these are some of our early work. That one, uh, the, the, the one on the, the small pale green one, I'd like to introduce it, that is child number one. That is the first crochet hyperbolic that Margaret made. <laughs> um, so th these are some of Dana's models showing you what hyperbolic geometry is. And so then we started like exploring what hyperbolic forms can do. So these are just, I'll take you, hyperbolic surfaces can be wrapped in many extraordinary ways. And all hyperbolic surfaces, when you, uh, if you, go, you can go in a, backwards and forwards in a line or round and round in a circle, and as you go round in a circle, it starts off flat and then it does one swoop, and then it does two swoops, and then it does three swoops, four swoops, five swoops, and as you keep going, you get more and more of these swoops, and you can get up to, if you, depending on the rate of crochet, you can get you know, if you were going very slowly, you could get hundreds of swoops before it turned into a ball. I like using one in every six stitches, and you can get about 30 swoops in, in one of these things before it turns into a big ball. Um, and you can see the incredibly different kinds of ways that you can fold this shape that is technically just a simple surface. Um, so, that, that's just sort of giving you some ideas about forms and, and, and how crochet can be used to explore literally structures and forms. But it can also be used to explore materials. So as I said, I'm not interested, I'm not, the, I'm not a minimalist, I'm a maximalist. So I started bringing home fluffy and sparkly yarns and bright coloured yarns. And as soon as we started crocheting with the fluffy and the sparkly and the bright coloured, they start looking organic. And 
The second thing that makes them look organic is if you deviate from the perfect code. The perfect code is simply do n stitches and then increase one. And if you do that perfectly, you get these things that look very uh, precise and formal and very symmetrical. But if you deviate and, and just, you know, like your stitching is uneven or you miss, a, you miss a stitch or you do too many in one, and especially if you use kind of more complicated yarns, the things start looking organic immediately. So they move from looking like models and pure conceptual things to looking organic. And they automatically either look like three things. They either look like cactuses, which is actually what we first produced, or they look like corals, or they look like funguses. And we do have a cactus garden, which we used to show. Then we have moved into the corals and it took off and we haven't yet produced a fungus garden, though <laughs> we talk about we should make a fungus garden. So, and the other thing that as soon, the, the other way to make things look organic is to put edges on them. So, uh, the, then, so the, then we started uh, putting things on pots, what we call pot pots, to raise them up and gradually the ecology grew. And this is the second thing that I think crochet can be used to explore evolution. And one of the things that Margaret and I like to say is that maybe life on Earth is developed by divine design. Maybe it, life on Earth did not develop through the mutations of random mutation in, evo in producing evolution. But the Crochet Coral Reef Project did develop through random mutation. And it is living proof that you can produce a diverse ecological system, or very diverse, many ecological systems, not just individual creatures, but whole systems. It is living proof that random mutation can produce evolution and diversity, because that is the way this, pro this project works. We don't tell anybody what to do. We just give them the formula, crochet, end stitches, and then and increase one. Choose your own wools, choose your own stitch rate, choose your colours, choose how big you want to make it, you do what you want. And what has been amazing to us is th the incredible diversity that this has produced. And the second way in which the project evolves is not just at the level of the individual items, but at the level of putting them together to make the ecologies, that is to say the reefs. So making the individual pieces is like producing the paint, putting them together is like making the painting. So I'm just showing you, just, I'm just bringing you forward in time, showing you historically how it's evolved. And I'd just like to point out here, the little lacy ones on top are pieces that I just bought in crafts, well, not in craft stores, home stores. Um, and they're made by workers in Chinese factories. And another thing I would like to point out is that there is not a dis fundamental distinction between the handmade and the, no and the automated or the, non the, the factory made, because many th almost everything that's produced in factory is made by hand. And uh, as well as incorporating, as well as our project uh, gradually accumulating many, 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 many more participants, we've now had 7,000 participants altogether, we also include a whole lot of unknown Chinese factory workers because we have used uh, factory made pieces and, and incorporated them into reef. And in fact, all the wool and all the sparkles and all the sequins are made by Chinese workers and we would like to pay homage to them as well. Um, so this is just brief pictures of how the project evolved. You'll notice that in the begin in the early works, they simulated aquariums rather than natural reefs. So they were all on these flat pedestals, but as we go along, they get bigger and they go upwards and they get become more vertical. So uh, another part of the exploration is uh, not just at the level of the individual pieces, but the evolution of structure, structures in space. And lastly, I'd just like to mention one thing Another aspect of the project that, that we also consider a, a form of research is to do with the plastic. After, just after we started the project, we discovered something called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is one of a, of a number of growing walls, worlds in the sea where, where plastic trash accumulates. Trash accumula has always accumulated in these places in the sea because it's where the world's currents bring everything. 
but most of the trash that historically has gathered there is organic, so it will eventually just disappear or sink to the bottom. Plastic doesn't sink or it, and it doesn't break down. So these, guy, these places are filling up with plastic. And so we, we started, there's a thing called plan where you cut up plastic bags and you, and you use it as a form of yarn. And people, many people in the third world actually use it as a, as a, as a practical um, medium. So we, we started working with plan and collecting our own plastic bags and cutting them up and of course you have to wash your plastic bags to do that. Um, so we started making toxic reefs made out of plastic and like the other woolen reefs, the toxic reefs also develop over time. So they started off very trashy and they get more and more structured as time goes by. And there's various, uh, that one is saran wrap, this one is videotape, this one, this one is actually a piece from the 60s. It's a, it's a doily made of very, very fine plastic thread. And this one's made from uh, electroluminescent wire by our oldest participant who actually recently passed away. Her name is Eleanor Kent and she calls her work Granny Tech. She's, a, she's an octogenarian. Um, so here's just a few pieces of plastic crochet work and this is previous exhibitions, you can see how it's growing and developing. And this is the show at the Smithsonian. This is the Smithsonian's reef, which was half plastic. And at the same time, uh, after we discovered Plan and we started working with plastic, we decided that we needed to know how much plastic we actually used. So we decided to actually keep all of our domestic plastic. So we washed and kept all of our plastic for four years. And as it piled up, as it grew, we exhibited with, uh, with the crochet coral reefs, with the, surrounded, by, surrounded by the toxic reefs. And the final four years worth, um, we call it the midden, after those, pat those mounds of detritus that you find around every human settlement on the planet which archaeologists love to use to find out about human uh, past societies. And we, we consider our midden to be a library for the future. Just, you know, garbage dumps are libraries for, for, future, for future research. Um, so our plastic trash four years worth finally became its own independent uh, object, which sometimes we exhibit with the reefs, but th this is four years worth of our trash. So um, what can crochet do? I think it is a research tool and you can research many, many things, one of which, and you can construct many things, one of which is communities. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to ask some questions actually based on what you just said, Christine, crochet is a research tool. I wondered if I can turn to Shauna and Toshiko. Uh, Shauna, I'd like to ask you, through your crochet, what have you learned about animals? Can you answer that? Um, it's really very little. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> anatomy, uh, you know, I've learned about the anatomy of an animal, but that's basically from my dog, which I think you saw a, a slide of her, I can translate her into anything. Um, but. It really, my work really isn't about animals, they're just a vehicle. There's a really accessible theme um, that I'm using. So, you know, along with the traditional craft and you know, the artist's hand and all sorts of unfashionable things in contemporary art, the animal is kind of, it's just so accessible. That's why I use it. And how do you find people interact with these animals? I mean, have you watched anything um, interesting? Yes, I have. Um, they obviously are taken at face value because there's nothing, the way that they're created in my mindset and how they've come about is completely hidden. There's just no, there's no explanation of that. I just present the piece as it is. So they're just taken at face value. Um, I think the thing that people react to the most is probably the human endeavor. You yeah. can just see it and uh, that's what they react to. It's, it's very positive. In all the stitching that you, yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. visible and yeah. all those knots. I think one last question though, there is a certain, if I can say, violence in some of 
the Thanks. images, the hanging rabbit and... Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. Um, no, I haven't really noticed it, but I, <laughs> I'm really trying not to create cuddly toys, which is quite a difficult thing to do with crochet. So I think sometimes mm -hmm. I step as far away from that as I possibly can, so I use jewels and, you know... Yeah things that are just not going to be mistaken for a teddy bear, really. Right, exactly, and taxidermy being yeah. that sort of remainder, the trace yeah. of the oh. living creature. Oh. Wonderful, thanks. And so a similar maybe question for you, Toshiko, is what have you learned about children and people and in your... Yes, I, to me, you know, as a childhood, I realized when I can communicate with somebody, who remember when they are child and what kind of time they had images. And uh, some I cannot communicate because they forgot they used to be child. Mm -hmm. And to me, this ch when you had a child was a very important forming as a human being. And we are not alone, you know. We, we live with other people and we have to understand each other physically, mentally. Then early stage of not just yourself, physically touching and playing and this emotion goes the other, this reaction is developed many parts of your brains. Mm. Then um, when I, you know, I told you I was going to medical school, I changed it, right? And my, one of my br brother is a pediatrician and uh, he works for premature babies years and he's a professor in the medical school and uh, he introduced kangaroo care for pretty much a baby which is sitting in the incubator and they many have mental problems they don't develop mm -hmm. then this kangaroo care from south american one is put in the mother's body direct and move and shake it then that helps with their mental development then uh, after you know so many years we are walking separate then he retired and um, he came one of my pieces with grandchildren in the up north and uh, he watched kids place and he said you are walking same direction which I was doing and with with more emotion you know he's more intellectual <laughs> but I as a female which I used to I didn't like it I want to be like my four brothers. I argue, fight, but I realize I have, we, we have a different sensibility and different part of the life, right? And that we can see things different way. And that's what I was offering to, to the future, but not just your own child. You know, they are autism, right? And they are dyslexia. And these, can be done in early stage, probably, I don't know, because I'm not a doctor, but there are lots of possibility, mm -hmm. a physical work with children in different environment, not like, a, you know, um, we, we lost many na natures, right? Mm -hmm. Then uh, if you create something, touch and feel it, and without any command, you know, children start creating their imagination and plays. And uh, one of the Hakone one, this sculpture, you know, architect's ch child, she was seven, she disappeared four hours hmm. in, in that space and came out sweat. Hmm. That much she can occupy their mind and physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then tired, right? And not, nobody falls, she just disappears and the parents cannot catch it. That's an, in another important part. You know, always parents can see it, that's not good. Kids has own space, and it's safe space, and they create strangers, strange kids meet each other, and push it, and vibration go the other one, and I cannot move, it just and start screaming. And the macro, you know, this museum, from way outside, when I'm getting close to, you know, you can see scream of, you know, how do you say, orchestra of children. It's just so much. <coughs> and uh, when we finished put in, you know, and the children went to, because we, we didn't introduce this is for children, but they took over, mm -hmm. said, you are adult, you shouldn't get in, this is for us. <laughs> we didn't tell them, this is for both of us. 
they knew. And when we were installing these things start hanging down, and evening, they are looking from gate, staring at what it is. <laughs> then soon as opened, and 7,000 7, people, no, 4,000 people came in opening days. They just knew what it is. And the children is just so, they don't communicate with language in early stages, and they just know, very honest. Mm -hmm. They just enjoy, they just feel it. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, to me, most great critic for me. Wonderful. You know. Thank you. OK. Well, that's wonderful. Moving on to another question for Christine. You mentioned that when deviations started to happen, the forms took on an organic shape. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you what that means for life or living life. Can you, I'm interested if we can talk a little bit about, we've seen the art and learned a little bit about your processes, but how does the act of making these things and thinking in this way impact you as you walk around your job, your life? Can you say anything about that? Um. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything that's just been said by Trishiko, that uh, the, the, the modern Western world that we've created, and, and now it's increasing with the digital age, people are not, people are, we are physical beings, we, 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 we are not just mental beings and we occupy physical space and, and we learn as much through what we do in physical space with our limbs and our senses as we learn through reading and writing and, and, and I love reading and writing but um, you learn different things and in a different way and it, act, it obviously, I mean, I'm not a brain scientist and I'm not particularly into brain science but you, 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 your brain, not, maybe it's not different parts of your brain, but your, your whole brain is activated differently when you are physically manipulating things in space and, 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 and manipulating materials, whether you're jumping up and down on them or whether you're doing them with your hands or whether you're throwing them at each other. Physical interaction and sensual interaction with the world and with other human beings I think I agree is, is absolutely crucial and um, we were taught to handicraft when we were young and uh, we also grew up very fortunately I think in we, we basically grew up in the bush so we were running around outside our whole life the, the idea of, of growing up in a bedroom <laughs> with a television screen to me, I, I just simply cannot imagine it, and I'm glad I can't imagine it because actually I think that's pretty close to my idea of hell. Uh, I mean, I've got other, there are other aspects of my hell, but that's, that would be a component of it. And, and, you know, I want to interact with the world physically and sensually, and, uh, you know, be, be, because I have to earn a living and, and, and I have certain skills that that the world is prepared to pay me for. It means I have to talk a lot, read a lot, think a lot, listen a lot, and sit a lot. I don't get in my paid occupation to have much sensual, physical re interaction with the world or with other people. So for me, the crochet project is a way of actually having something in my life that my paid, and I enjoy my paid life, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but, mm -hmm. but I need, you know, even when I was, you know, I have three, three degrees in the, you know, the, the higher learning, you know, uh, philosophy and literature, which couldn't be more sort of de-physicalised, at least in the Western form. But even when I was doing my PhD long before we had this um, crochet project, the entire time I made these incredibly elaborate wraps for, my, for various people with abstract beading. I just started beading and, and I think, you know, I spent thousands of hours at this and I sometimes I think, why did I do that? And I think it was just simply I needed to play with materials and colour. I just need to play with colour and materials and interact with something physically and sensually. And colour for me is just like, I need colour and I need to play with it, not just sort of 
absorb it as, a, a, as an audience, but to actually manipulate it. Um, and I just can't imagine life without that. And I, I think it's very sad that children are growing up now with all these toys that say, do this, do that, you know, this is red, this is blue. I mean, <laughs> they learn much better playing with one of Toshiko's things. Uh, and complete, and as she said, out of un, away from parental gaze. Mm. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I wondered, Shona, if you could talk a little bit about scale in your work, because I noticed that the crochet dermy most objects were life size. Life size yeah. And then, can you talk about your decision to change scale radically with the Tigers project? I can. Um, yeah, the pieces that I make are life-size, um, that's because of the taxidermy element of it. So as close as they can be to actual animals, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. That's also why I use one colour. If I use any more than one colour, it starts to look a little bit like a toy again, so that's right. why I just use the one colour. Um, this, the Lion's Lionheart project was the only project that I've done that hasn't been life-size scale. Um, and the reason that I did that was because it was it was a big public art project and it needed to be big. Good. So that's, that's the reason that they were. And they were as big as they could possibly be um, to be able to travel on the road without a police escort. So I oh. started off with the dimensions of the case and then just stuffed it full of lions. Right, really. Wonderful. Um, and it's three lions because it's um, Richard the Lionheart's crest who has associations with the region that I come from. Great. I think it's a wonderful example of how constraints make work and that you had that constraint with the yeah. police escort. That's brilliant. Everybody <laughs> who's thinking about their essay for one of my classes and their, their word count right now is enjoying that constraint for sure. I guess my final question for you, oh, anybody who'd like to answer this before we start taking questions from the audience. Um, the name of this talk is Radical Craft. And um, can you speak about radicality in terms of some people interpret that to mean that art might change the world or that there's something um, that might be connected to activism. Um, can any of you speak to that at all? I know the Crochet Coral Reef Project has an eco story to it, but I wondered if any of you would like to comment generally on that term radical and how you interpret it. I, I, you know, I think it's quite important. You know, as an artist, I realize society is changing. Mm -hmm. Then I, you know, instead of museum artwork, I move it out. And then I approach public, uh, how do you say, national park and mm -hmm. those kind of place, and uh, very difficult to talk. They have a different language. They don't talk with artists. Then I have to convince them to change their mind. You know, if they want to have something new. Okay, then I involved it. But no, I don't want to change for the maintenance. That's too much trouble, right? Mm. Okay, then that was a you know 1978 and nine project, and the approach I did for director. You know, if you don't change your mind, well, maintenance, you never have anything new. And if children play things, is if it's alive, you have to maintain. It's not like stone, it's not like a concrete, it's not like metal. You have to maintain. And if you have to introduce this maintenance idea, just like a taking care of plants, and the children, you have to take care of them. Their body is soft it's not strong, then if you don't change that, you never had anything new. Mm. And he understood. And 50 people, got, and half of people, not 50, 50%, 50 they're against it. But you know, the director said, go ahead to do it. Mm. 10 years later, I had a phone call from the director of National Park in Tokyo. He said, I was the one against the man who was the most strong one. I had two kids play that net. The other type of, not in showing. And, and then I moved all national park, but I have never seen anything like that. Let's make it in Tokyo. Okay, then I made a gigantic 50 meter by 50 meter place. And even now, sometimes in a day, 4,000 kids play on it. 
we need a maintenance, our staff goes there, you know, it's just mended, just like fabric, right? Mm -hmm. Then in that, that was um, 1991 we completed. Then young men who were working that time became director, 10 years in, in director of the northern part of National Park. And he contacted me, let's do it in mm -hmm. Northern, every 10 years, right? <laughs> then made a gigantic organic shape, the same landscape architect who was my student in the University of Georgia. We collaborated work, then we made, that was uh, quite sensational. Then you need, to, then, per maintenance, head of the maintenance director in Northern part of Japan, last one, he was my first national park person in charge of the young person. And he became head of the mm -hmm. main maintenance director. Mm -hmm. And the things are changed then. So now in Japan, you know, in, you know, maintenance was accepted. Mm -hmm. In National Park, then there are many interesting, you know, place space was created. So the idea of you have even to that push place it. space is, it's you an evolution, but yes. you have to push yes. it. Yes. Do any of you else want to comment on what you take to be as radical about your work or craft in general or any or um, art? I don't, it's not really a word that I've associated with it before, but obviously coming here, I've, you know, sort of thought, is it radical? But I think that it's probably, um, it's maybe changing a bit now, but when I first started using crochet to make art, mm -hmm. contemporary art, it's extremely radical. Mm -hmm. And it still hasn't been accepted, so I think I'm probably doing the right thing. So to succeed, I have to fail. <laughs> so I'm failing Great. perfectly well, yeah. <laughs> it's not true. Oh, it's not Thank you. Well. Thank you for your beautiful failures. It's <laughs> great. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Yes. 20 years after I was invited in Macro, you know, Contemporary Museum? Yeah. Because once I started working there, I was kicked up from the museum. I was, uh, you know, in the 70s, uh, mainstream as a five artist. But curator was kind of shocked, you know, she's hanging kids, right? Yeah. It's not art. <laughs> I had a great time. But uh, <laughs> then I, oh, fine, I cannot you know, use language well. It's not, you know, it, it's right now that's uh, not my world. And I walk and I convince government and all this mm -hmm. national you know, park and walk outside. Nobody thinks I'm artist, you know, carrying all these tools and start working like this, you know, <laughs> then, you know, then suddenly I was called in the macro and I made it in a contemporary art piece. Wonderful. It, it, to me, it doesn't matter. If you believe it, you just do your life, wonderful. you know? That's wonderful, thank you. Um, for me, I think the, the aspect of our project that is the part that I think of is radical is bringing the work of ordinary people into museum and gallery spaces mm -hmm. and I, I believe there's enormous uh, creativity is not the privilege of a few special people everybody has the capacity to be creative if they're encouraged and they have parameters that, that enable them to do it and the parameters of the crochet reef project don't enable everybody but they enable a lot of people and I think that's for me, what, that's what I admire about it and that's what I think is, that's what is inspiring to me about it. Great, thank you. What the ordinary yeah. citizens do. Great. And on that note, thank you so much for that discussion. Thank you. In terms of children playing in these crochet-made artifacts, how do you maintain the safety standards as you said that in, uh, it's a natural organic product that can deteriorate over time? How does natural maintenance and longevity of the uh, play area maintain? Yes, uh, that aspect, you know, I, I worked with children so many years and the first of experience, then they, when, I, when I started there is no regulations in the play area at that time. The, but I observe children and I change the you know, height and the stretchness and tension, how I crochet, you know, many years. And now there's a regulations and regulation is just perfect. <laughs> you know, I'm, no problem, no problem, right? Then, but always, you know, place have to have a maintenance staff. And when we install, we work together. 
then uh, some place, uh, you know, if it's in Japan, I have a few staff who works. These are the, another new way of thinking, probably, because I cannot keep staff to pay money. Then when things that happens, comes together, number of artists, then do work and disappears. Then that will pay it. Then one woman who, uh, who has a children, she just born, she has her own apartment, has a telephone and a computer. Then she organizes with my communication, then send that message, and these are get together, and even get in government park to do this. You know, then uh, so far, we don't have problem. And if we feel this client, we will have problem, we don't do it. The, if they should understand it, you know, situations, and if they like it, it will last if it's indoors, like, um, you know, of crocheting one is like probably 20 years easily. Just you need a washing. Because sometimes kids have trouble. Kids might have, <laughs> you know, difficulty, you know, and it gets so excited, they might, you know, coming out. <laughs> then, you know, you have to wash it once in a while. That's good. Yeah. You just don't need shoes and uh, nothing in hand. That was the regulations. Then you can climb up. Shoes is the most dangerous, <gasps> even sneakers. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a soft material and hit on hand, mm -hmm. it then damage it. But if it's a feet, mm -hmm. then nylon has observed that mm -hmm. and go down and never been problem. Even hit each other. That's why I use nylon. Nylon is a, you know, how do you say, in the car they use Safety bottle, how do you say? That's a nylon 6.6, six. the best material for those kind of situations, and that's why we use that one, material. Um, I'm wondering how you cope with the potential threat, let's say, of mass production of your artwork. Uh, I mean, we've all yeah. been to craft fairs and seeing somebody making something fun and funky and unusual, yeah. and next year it's in Ikea. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it does. The, you know, my work is from 1978. No, I patented that's one before I make in public park, right? That protections, but still people do, you know, and a similar, very similar image of the net was produced in Japan, a different type, not crochet one, but they don't understand. They are. These are the men's design, I should say. <laughs> you know, it looks perfect, and they think they improved in the corner and those. They, they lost flexibility, and they they will last longer than ours, but nothing fun to play, oh. and they, nobody ever really complete copied it. No, then government used it. Some park, you know, took over our project, but. The other main park, they watching those said, oh, that's no good, then came back to us. We replaced <laughs> many, you know, every certain years, and this over, over four, in, let's see, 24 years, you know, we, we repeat several times and still come back. Because visually it looks like it, but it's, it is not true. They don't understand textile, they don't understand fiber, they don't understand tension, gravity, all this just looks like it. Designers work, right? Then, you know, so far, it's not really, but the one organic one was produced in Korea, something very crafty, very similar, but still did not understand tensions, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> uh, it's a c c geometry, right? Geometry and uh, physics, you know, and then fiber and character and handwork, all mixed in. And Actually, color. it's quite complicated, and yeah. color mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, painting, right? Then uh, quite complicated. Um, hello, my name is Angela and I'm from Scotland and I love handicrafts. Um, because of that, I know that I get hand pain if I'm working for a long time. So how on earth do you crochet for so many hours a day? And if you get sore, what do you do about it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> because, you know, my piece is like uh, one ton, right? We create one ton of fiber and dyed and braided and hand crocheting five milli to six milli, and my hand was already crooked. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I work, you know, seven, eight hours, and uh, when, for long pieces, I did 14 hours in the day. In the installation, I did 16 hours. Mm -hmm. Slept like, a, you know, three, four hours, and get up and install, right? And it's so sore, and it's just, just kidding me, but I do yoga. Every time when I miss, I do yoga. That helps a lot. But the other hand, when you're concentrating mentally, another word, zoning. If someone told me, I don't get it. I have to come back like this. You know, then just, it's a mental, how do you say, stimulations. And in a way, it's comfortable. You know, because I make, I imagine something, you know, beautiful, right? And just go it. And then I'm not living this world anymore. <laughs> you know, face changes, then sometimes someone says something, I can hear, right? Then something that, oh, oh, oh yes, you know? <laughs> then it's a kind of a, a, a trip. It, then I could do it, because if I, if I have to, if somebody force me something I don't like, I cannot do anything. But when I'm enjoying and hearing voice of children and just imagine, you know, maybe I make this is a little bit tight and hard to get in, you know, or maybe I will do this way, you know, just, 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 like, just like kids, right? Then, then pain is not so much. <laughs> Shona, Christine, do you have anything to add about? Um, I'm, I'm very lucky. I, 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 I'm sure I haven't crocheted as much as Toshiko, but, or Shona for that matter, actually. <laughs> but um, I, I haven't suffered. I haven't suffered from it. I, I, I think some people's bodies just suit it. Um, some people get RSI and some people don't. So I haven't got any advice. <laughs> um, I, when I did the Olympic project, it was two years of full time. You know, I was there in my pajamas doing it. You know, same as you, around the clock. Um, but I used to I used to put my just in case I would get RSI. I used to put my hands into a bucket of ice water at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But whether that worked or not, I have no idea. But um, I do try and keep an eye on it. But like Toshiko was saying, you you're in a kind of zone where. I guess your hands are really, you're all comfortable, aren't you? Your whole yeah. being is comfortable. It's so. very strange, you know, you, repeating, you know, your question, repeating action is uh, going to the zone. It's the uh, same thing dancing too, right? If you do the same motions, mm. then you, you are not in this world anymore. Mm. Just your mind is full focus for something and stimulate. Yes. Then it's a kind of joy when I'm making, you know. But more like calculating and communicating, that was a painful <laughs> job. <laughs> well, on that final note of joy and the beautiful repetition of textile arts, um, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the panelists so much. If we could give them another round of applause.